Geology is a fascinating science. We get to understand how the world formed, how islands were uplifted from deep seas, and how tectonic events shaped the landscapes around us. Flinders Island is a perfect example, a place with a geological history that tells the story of ancient seas, volcanic eruptions, and the uplift that occurred during massive mountain building events which thrust the land up from the deep sea. From the crystalline granite intrusions of its mountainous regions, to the limestone deposits from former shallow seas, Flinders Island's geological construction offers a unique glimpse into Earth's dynamic past. Let's explore how these forces came together to create the island's rugged beauty and mineral diversity, revealing the secrets of its formation across hundreds of millions of years. Flinders Island is located very close to Tasmania. Western Tasmania is part of an ancient microcontinent known as Van Dyland. Notice I say Western Tasmania, and this is for a good reason. In a future video, I will cover the collision and joining of the east and west of Tasmania, which occurred during the Devonian. Be sure to subscribe if that interests you. Western Tasmania contains rocks that are around 1.6 billion years old. It's had quite a significant journey through time before it collided with Australia between 500 to 430 million years ago. It has connections to Antarctica and even North America. In fact, it was the erosion from both of these landmasses that led to its initial construction. I've already made an episode on that and on the geological construction of Tasmania, and you can find both of those videos in the description below. Tasmania and King Island have both existed for the same period of time, but Flinders Island is much younger. During Ordovician, 485 million to 444 million years ago, Flinders Island was submerged beneath a deep ancient sea, as indicated by deposits of the Mathena supergroup, which consists of marine turbidites made up of mudstone and micaceous quartz wacky. These sediments were laid down on the sea floor, showing that the region was once a deep marine environment. So what are turbidites? Well, underwater landslides leading to turbidite formation typically begin with sediment accumulation on a continental shelf, where layers of mud, sand and other materials build up over time. As the sediment layers thicken, they become increasingly unstable, particularly during events such as earthquakes, storms or rapid sediment loading. This is a present day continental shelf, Material from rivers carry sediment to the ocean. This sediment can accumulate on the shelf, and then, boom, submarine landslide and turbidite deposits occur. These triggers can cause the sediment to suddenly collapse and flow down the continental slope as a dense, fast-moving turbidity current. The current sweeps the sediment into deeper ocean basins, where the particles settle out by size. Coarser grains like sand drop first, while finer mud and silt settle later, creating the graded bedding characteristic of turbidites. Turbidity currents can travel impressive distances, ranging from tens to hundreds of kilometres in more localised events, up to 1,500 kilometres for larger flows, and even exceeding 3,000 kilometres in extreme cases. The extensive turbidite deposits of the Mathena supergroup on Flinders Island reveal a history of repeated, far-reaching underwater flow events, preserving a record of deep marine processes that shaped this region during the Ordovician. The turbidites continued to be deposited through the Silurian period, 444 to 419 million years ago, and into the early Devonian, 419 to 393 million years ago. And after that, well, it's uplift time, and it begins with the Tabarabra and Orogeny. The Tabarabra and Orogeny, occurring during the Middle Devonian, around 385 to 380 million years ago, was a brief yet intense tectonic event that reshaped southeastern Australia affecting regions in Victoria, New South Wales, and Tasmania. Driven by tectonic compression along the eastern edge of Gondwana, this orogeny caused widespread folding, faulting, uplift, and crustal thickening. The compression generated enough heat to partially melt the crust, resulting in significant granite intrusions that are visible today due to later uplift and erosion. This event marked a major transition, ending marine sedimentation and uplifting previously submerged regions above sea level subjecting them to erosion and forming rugged landscapes. And it's likely that along with being uplifted from the deep sea, Flinders Island's first glimpse at sub-aerial life involved the development of a mountain range, or at the very least an elevated terrain that has completely eroded today, unveiling the once deep granitic batholiths, which were previously vast deep magma chambers that never made it to the surface to erupt, and instead cooled and solidified, only to be later uplifted. They now dominate the islands in this region and the northeastern part of Tasmania. These granite batholiths were very deep in the earth when they formed, and their emergence to the surface occurred during something known as isostatic rebound. 
This is a process where the Earth's crust slowly rises or rebounds in response to the removal of weight from above, like the effects of erosion. Imagine a crust as a flexible block floating on a denser layer beneath. When heavy weight such as mountains or thick layers of rock is removed over millions of years, the crust responds by slowly lifting itself up to find a new balance, much like a sponge rising back up when you stop pressing on it. Over millions of years, erosion stripped away the upper layers of rock on Flinders Island. With this loss of mass, the crust underneath the island felt less pressure pushing it down. This removal of weight allowed the crust to slowly rise or rebound upward to balance out the loss. This gradual uplift helped expose the Devonian and Carboniferous granite batholiths that we see on the island today. While isostatic rebound didn't create dramatic mountains, it allowed the deep-seated granite to come even closer to the surface as layers above were eroded away. Even as the crust rebounded, erosion continued to wear down the surface, keeping a balance over millions of years. This combination of isostatic rebound and erosion eventually exposed the ancient rocks that were once buried many kilometres deep. In the last video, we looked at the Killicranky diamonds that exist on Flinders Island. Spoiler alert, these aren't actually diamonds. They are a form of high quality clear topaz that looks strikingly similar to a diamond. In that episode, we looked at the formation of these topaz gemstones, which is tied into the geological construction of Flinders Island. I'll also include a link to that video in the description. So after the Tabarabra orogeny ended, Flinders Island was uplifted and turbidite deposits ended. The region remained relatively stable for around 200 million years until the breakup of Gondwana occurred. During this time of relative stability, marked erosion of the former uplifted terrain occurred, and the granite began to be exposed to the surface. Gondwana began breaking apart during the Mesozoic era, with initial rifting between various landmasses starting around 180 million years ago in the Jurassic period. The separation that directly affected the area around Australia and Antarctica occurred later, in the Cretaceous period 145 million to 66 million years ago. The Tasman Sea began to form due to the rifting between Australia and Zealandia, a submerged continental fragment that includes New Zealand, during the late Cretaceous around 85 to 55 million years ago. This rifting extended into the Cenozoic, creating the Tasman Sea and contributing to the separation of Australia from Antarctica. Even though the Tabarabra orogeny ended around 380 million years ago, the tectonic compression of the region didn't entirely cease. Instead, southeastern Australia, including Tasmania and areas like Flinders Island, remained under compressional forces for a long period afterward due to the ongoing plate convergence along the eastern edge of Gondwana. However, the rifting event changed these forces to extension, as Zealandia began pulling away from Australia. This shift from compression to extension marked the start of crustal thinning and stretching along the eastern margin of Gondwana. The change from compression to extension led to isostatic adjustments in the crust around Flinders Island. Isostatic adjustments refer to the slow, vertical movements of the Earth's crust as it seeks to maintain a balance with the denser layers below it. As Zealandia drifted further away, the crust beneath Flinders Island responded by flexing slightly upward due to the reduced tectonic pressure. This flectural adjustment or minor uplift wasn't dramatic but helped maintain the island's elevation as the surrounding crust adjusted to the new tectonic regime. During the Cenozoic, the period starting around 66 million years ago, Flinders Island experienced volcanic activity that was likely characterised by small scattered eruptions from fissures and vents rather than large sustained volcanic structures like stratovolcanoes. Evidence of falsic rhyolite, tuff and a variety of mafic to intermediate volcanic rocks suggests that the island saw explosive eruptions, with ash and pyroclastic materials spread across the landscape, and effusive lava flows, a type of eruption characterised by low explosivity that releases voluminous fast-flowing lava. However, the lack of large volcanic landforms implies that these eruptions produce smaller features. The magma source for the Cenozoic volcanic eruptions on and around Flinders Island is likely linked to the tectonic processes associated with the rifting of Zealandia and the opening of the Tasman Sea. This rifting would have left residual heat and weakened areas in the crust. These conditions allowed for localised volcanic activity to occur even millions of years after the initial rifting. When hot basaltic magma comes into contact with granite-rich continental crust, it transfers heat to the surrounding rocks, which can lead to partial melting of granitic material. This process can create a more silica-rich magma, like rhyolite or dacite, as the basaltic magma mixes or melts parts of the granite. In a study, there were several eruptive centres listed. 
there appears to be two locations where explosive eruptions occurred, which are listed here. Along with this, effusive eruption centres occurred in these locations. Finally, there also appears to have been a shallow sea that crossed over sections of the island. There are limestone deposits suggesting a shallow sea intruded into the island. There is a website that states the limestone near Tanner's Bay is related to sand dunes. Limestone can form from sand dunes when calcium carbonate particles, often from marine shells or coral fragments, accumulate and cement together within the dune environment. So parts of Flinders Island have been built up within the past 66 million years, likely as a result of the recent volcanism that occurred here. Today the island is primarily composed of sediments eroded from granite, along with limestone, sandstone and other sedimentary deposits that reflect its long geological history. These layers tell a story of ancient uplift, volcanic activity, and coastal processes that have shaped the island over millions of years, leaving behind rugged landscapes and unique mineral formations. So this is the geological story of Flinders Island, from a deep sea to a rugged landscape shaped by ancient tectonic forces, volcanic activity, and erosion over millions of years. Today its exposed granites, limestone formations, and unique mineral deposits offer a glimpse into the dynamic processes that brought this island to life. I hope you found this video to be as interesting as I did. And as always, thanks for watching. Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.